measurement. So now we see the problem here is that we have only two temperature sensors for around like 20 cells in here, which means like we only have like one temperature sensor for every 10 cells. So such sparse temperature sensing cannot provide a detailed temperature distribution uh, about the battery system across the whole pack. And on the other hand, these sensors are usually attached to the casing of the cell. And in this case, it's the top casing, which means that it can only measure, it can only measure the surface, but not the core temperature of the cell. And the core temperature is typically higher and also more critical. And as for the solutions, I have been working on combining sparse temperature sensing with the model-based estimation technique to enhance the temperature monitoring of the uh, battery systems. And uh, specific topics include uh, modeling, system identification, and also model-based estimation of the temperature state. And uh, this work is sponsored by the U.S. Army Tardic Research Center to enhance the thermal management of hybrid military electric vehicles under uh, all climate conditions because this is kind of uh, pretty critical for them. And uh, so the first step is thermal modeling. Uh, let's look at the single cell first. So this is the single cell model uh, I've been trying to use. So we have, uh, for each cell, we have two states, the core temperature TC and the surface temperature TS. Here are the governing equations. And uh, in the battery core, we have a heat, a, a heat generation term, I squared times RE. I is the current input, and RE is the battery internal resistance. Uh, we also have a conductive heat exchange term between the surface and the core. And at the surface, we also have a convective heat exchange term between the surface and the outside air, which accounts for the cooling effects. And so the next step is system modification. That is, I will need to determine the model parameters. Uh, I've managed to design an online identification algorithm uh, that can perform its parameter ID automatically by using the uh, commonly measured onboard signals, such as the single cell surface temperature TS and the current input I. And uh, so then I try to do experiments to validate the identified model. Uh, the purpose of, of using this model is to estimate the unmeasured battery core temperature TC. So in order to make sure that our model can predict the TC correctly, we need to measure it in the, under laboratory settings. So this is what we did. We took a cylindrical cell, we drew a hole through the top casing, and then we inserted a thermal couple in, in, into the cell to measure its core temperature. And uh, so we make sure that this kind of a procedure doesn't uh, affect the performance of battery. We do experiment before the, before the drilling and also after it, and we don't see any difference. And uh, so with, with this test setup, uh, I have then tried to conduct the experiment by using the uh, current profile from an actual drive cycle. And uh, I, so this is the result in showing here. So this is the measured surface temperature TS. Uh, I use this surface temperature along with the current input to parameterize the model. Uh, this plot in here shows the convergence of the four parameters. Uh, and then I use the, this model, uh, and then I try to use this model to estimate the core temperature. And finally, I try to compare the estimation and the measurements of the core temperature to see how good the model is. And the results are shown here. So the blue and the red line, uh, sorry, the black and the red line stands for the measurements and the estimates of the core temperature TC. And we can see that they match very well with each other in uh, doing experiments. So this is how I validate this model. So ideally, then we can use this model to estimate the battery core temperature in the real battery system without the need to repeat the instrumentation of core temperature, which is not allowed in a real vehicle due to the safety concerns. And uh, so more details can be found in these two of my publications. Question. Oh, so yes. Here, did you consider different types of workloads for estimation? Or different types of what? Different types of uh, workloads for estimation, as in the, the temperature would depend on how much current you are drawing and the pattern of currents that you are drawing. So does this, do, do you think this works for any workload on the particular cell or is it specific to a given type of workload that is within your interest? Oh, you mean the uh, workload, you take, typically you're talking about the current load, right? Yes. Uh, we, we did have tested under different, uh, we, we, under different like, uh, current input and also we have tested under different ambient temperatures. So for the, for the thermal model, we can use like the, the maximum uh, like arrows will be within one degree C. So I've, we, we have varied this model under different. What temperature range did you do? Uh, we, we go as low as like uh, uh, five degrees C and high, high, as high as like 45 degrees C. Okay, but, but you can have, in, even in Michigan, you'll have minus 30 and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Temperature, right? So did you try any of those? Yeah, uh, so uh, for that part, I think we have also tried that uh, I think for the for the uh, the points like uh, that, that's a very good question. So the points like for the for the thermal model is like we have some difficulty in like sub zero temperatures. 
uh, mainly because of the heat generation. So the thermal model itself, it's 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 pretty okay for that. But I think the major errors will be in the in the in the in the heat generation term. Mm -hmm. So maybe I cannot use a single resistance to lump the 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 like heat generation under very low temperature. So yeah, that's a very good question. So what exactly are you identifying? Um, that's a, uh, okay. So this is the Barry thermal model, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm identifying a couple, uh, four parameters in here: the CC, mm -hmm. the heat capacity of the core, mm -hmm. and the uh, internal resistance RE, okay. and RC, the conductive heat exchange term uh, between the core and the surface, and also the RU, the Only identifying the thermal dynamics, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, also uh, the things like uh, I have performed like uh, identifiability analysis. And I figure that it is not possible. Like I'm only using, I'm only measuring TC. I can, I can kind of identify all these four or five parameters. It's not possible. So I figure that I can only combine, I can only estimate three of them. So by constructing a parametric model, I see like five of them lumped into three kind of lumped parameters. I can only identify three of them. So I need to assume that I know two of them to determine the rest of three. So then I also have some assumption there. For example, I think like CC and the CS, the heat capacity and the core and the surface are something that is kind of uh, easy to assume. We can have get some values from the manufacturers. And also these two values typically does not change over lifetime. So we assume values for these two and then we determine the rest. Why do those parameters change with time? Uh, in the heat capacity, why do those change with time? Uh, I think this is, this, this is actually the convergence, convergence process. So after they converge to the values, uh, they, doesn't, they, they don't really change a lot. But for the resistance, they do change because the resistance depends on temperature. So resistance does change. But for the other, like the heat conduction resistance, uh, they, they typically don't change a lot. So this done online? Or? Yeah, this done online. I do kind of a recursive least square uh, algorithm to, to do the uh, estimation. So, Professor Petty, you have done some like total least square for other capacity estimation. Now. So, this kind of similar in there, yeah. So, because this is done for like some just for single cell, so it is the computational load is not that hard to do. So, yeah. So, should I continue? So, if you change to a different uh, loading condition, so you're going to get the same. Uh Resistance values, I assume, right? Uh, we tested with the, the resistant values, the, the, uh, the, the conductive uh, resistant value, they don't really change much. But the internal resistance of the cell do may change at some point because of the temperature variation. Okay. okay. Also, uh, is it a sound assumption to mark the resistor as constant? As in, can, can you have that as a time varying parameter? Oh, you mean the RE here? Yeah. Yeah, so actually in this case, so uh, functional yeah, so in this case, actually, I'm doing online identification, which is like I'm, I'm thinking about like I have to keep this RE as a varying resistance because I'm running this, uh, this algorithm online continuously. So, so it is actually capturing the, the change of this resistance over time because this is very important. So we can also, I th I'm also thinking about like I can put a like forgetting factor in there. So to keep it like more varying. So for the rest of the parameters, it's okay. But for this one, it's pretty tricky. So how often do you re-estimate? Like, I'm sorry. How often do you re-estimate? Re like, uh, so are you just using the fading memory type of thing, or do you do chunks of? Oh, you mean moving horizon things? Like uh, I'm just doing recursive. I'm, I'm updating every single time instance. But I I need to put some kind of a constraint in there to 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 kind of avoid like doing this kind of uh, fluctuating too too much often. So. Continue. Okay, so then based on a single cell model, I try to construct the uh, Barry system thermal model, and which scaling up the single cell model and considering the thermal interaction between cells. And uh, so this is the, the model for the for the Barry stream, and uh, this is a single cell model, and uh, this part captures the cell to cell heat conduction between adjacent cells, for example through the tabbing connecting them, and also this part captures the thermodynamics of the coolant flow. And uh, more details can be found in these two of my papers. Uh, so now I have the model. The final step is to design a, a model-based observer. I guess you can do a similar kind of thing for a series parallel type configuration. So. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so for, the, for, the, for the series pack, the, 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 the easy part is that the current is the same for all the cells. For the, for the parallel, uh, it's kind of an issue. And uh, in, in, actually, in a real vehicle system, uh, most of cases, we prefer all the cells to be connected in series. Yeah. This is because for one way, uh, we only have one, one current sensor. 
we cannot afford to put a, a current sensor for every single cell. If we put them in parallel, what, then the... What if one cell goes bad? <laughs> the string? Yeah, yeah that's, that's concern, but, <laughs> but that's, that's the point at this... But that's the, the, the kind of the situation at this point, so, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, so, so for battery thermal systems, uh, we can measure the current input. So normally I can feed the current into the model to calculate the temperature states. And uh, so the temperature states are the surface and core temperature of all the cells in the battery systems. And uh, also we can measure the output TM. TM typically consists of the surface temperatures of the cells with sensors on them. Like we only have one sensor for every 10 cells. So these are the cell surface temperature with sensors on them. And then I compare the difference between TM and the TM hat, the estimates of the TM. And then I try to feed the estimation error back to the model to um, correct the estimation. So in this way, we can have a closed loop and a robust estimation of the uh, temperature states. However, we still have an issue here caused by sparse temperature sensing. So previously, I mentioned that I, I, I did a parameter ID at a cell level, which is that I used, the, I used the measured surface temperature and used this signal to identify the model parameters. So which means that uh, I can know the parameters of the cells with sensors on them. So for the rest of the cell, that is like 9 out of 10 cells, I don't know their parameters uh, precisely. And therefore, there will be a mismatch between the, the model and the actual systems, which might lead to significant estimation errors uh, in reality. And this is something we need to, I need to deal with during the process of observer design. And uh, so let me form, formulate this problem in a more clear way, in a clearer way. So the, the previous battery thermal model can be put in state-based representation as in this form. Uh, I want to emphasize the B matrix in here. And this matrix consists of the internal resistance of each cell in the battery string, uh, REI. And uh, so as a matter of fact, this resistance will vary, not just over time, but also vary among cells due to factors such as manufacturing variability or like degradation. So like I mentioned, I can only know the RE for the cells with sensors on them. For the rest of the cell, I need to assume that they have the same value. But uh, so which is likely that we have, kind of have some kind of model uncertainty in the resistance for the cells without sensors on them, which is delta REI in here. Uh, we do not know the exact value of this delta REI, but uh, it is safe to say that they will fall within a certain range, for example, 10% of the nominal value based on our past experience. So then the goal here is to design an optimal worst-case observer. Specifically, uh, we, we design observer, for example, in this form. Uh, because we have model uncertainty in here, so it is inevitable that we will have some estimation error, t minus t hat. And uh, so the goal here is to minimize uh, estimation error related cost function j. What is x hat? I, I suppose it's t hat, right? Oh, sorry, t hat, yeah. t minus t hat. Y hat is the... Oh, yeah, sorry, this is a typo there. Yeah, this should be yeah, t, 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 t m hat and uh, t, t hat. Yeah, so, uh, so the interesting part is that the observer is not designed to minimize a specific j under a specific set of delta re. It's to minimize the maximum of j under all possible combinations of delta re. So as long as each of its components fall within the, the Thompson bound we assumed previously. So in this way, we can have a, a robust observer that can guarantee minimize worst case errors under all possible degrees of uncertainties. And then I've tried to design, use different methods to design this observer. Uh, one of the, the methods is the robust H infinity observer. And uh, so the, the, I, I don't have time to cover the details in here. And uh, more, more information can be found in this two of my papers. And so this slide here shows the performance of the observer. And so this estimator is capable of estimating the, 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 the surface and core temperature of each cell in the battery systems. So each soil line here stands for a temperature state. And in addition, uh, the, the estimator can also provide a worst case estimation deviation under the 10% risk system uncertainty, as indicated by these two uh, red dash line here. So we can know that in the worst case, the actual value will be within these two uh, bonds of the estimation, uh, as long as the resistance uncertainty will be, uh, is within this 10% bond. And uh, so the next uh, uh, topic I've explored for the system level battery management is reduced battery voltage sensing. So uh, well, I see that the ranges are pretty small. I would assume that the, as time goes by, the, there would be divergence among the estimation, mainly because you are using uh, variation in the resistance values. So is there any intuition why the estimated ranges are, don't increase as time goes by? Or yeah, that's a very good question. So you're talking about like 
uh, we, we should see like div divergence of the uh, of the estimation error over time, right? Yeah. Uh, so the point is that uh, uh, here's that what we have good thing here is like the thermal system is stable. So the thermal system is stable. So basically, like the, your or, your initial errors will die out over time. But the point is like this process is very slow. So that's why we need to use the like a measurement based like feedback control to to kind of accelerate this process. But over long term, because the thermal system is is kind of uh, stable, so we, we will not suffer a lot from like accumulation of error over time. Okay, so uh, so uh, for the, the second topic is the reduced battery voltage sensing. And uh, so the problem we have here is kind of opposite to the previous one. So here we have too much voltage sensing. Previously we have too few voltage sen uh, temperature sensing. And uh, so let's go back to the battery packing here. And uh, so this is a sensor housing. And uh, so all the silver tabs in here are the sensing leads for the voltage measurement. So basically, we need like uh, to measure the voltage of every single cell for over voltage protection. So and uh, so the disadvantages are that uh, on one hand, it, it increases the cost and complexity of the system, just considering like how many cells we have in the battery systems. And on the other hand, it also brings difficulty for maintenance. And uh, so. Some of you may be wondering, it's like sensors are so cheap these days, and uh, and also I'm talking about like temperature and voltage sensors. They are very common sensors. So why do you keep making such a big deal out of sensors? Uh, the point is, is that uh, the sensing is a big deal in auto industry. So for one thing, auto industry is notorious for its low profit or margin rate. So for example, for the for the company I'm working at, the Ford Motor Company, our margin rate uh, is only about like eight uh, percent in good years. And in bad years, it can be as low as like four or five percent if we're not losing money. And uh, so, and uh, so, even for like industry leaders like Toyota, their margin rate is less than fifteen percent in, in good years. It's not like kind of consumer electronics like those guys like they can easily top like forty percent, so they can put whatever they want into their cell phones. And uh, and when it comes to electric vehicles, it's even worse. Uh, nobody's making any single penny from making or selling electric vehicles these days, including Tesla. The more we make, the more we sell, the more money we lose because the quantity is so low and the cost is so high at this point. So we are really wishing like the very bottom of, of our pocket to save all the cost we can. And on the other hand, so besides cost, there's also one thing special about the use of sensors in auto industry, which is called like OBD, the onboard diagnostics. So which actually says like every time you want to put a sensor in the vehicle, you have to have a way to diagnose it whenever anything wrong um, goes with it. So or they originally have it for internal combustion engine vehicle, but now they are also doing it for uh, electric vehicles. So which means that the more sensors you have in there, you have more trouble like diagnose it, and this also prevents like a lot of like normal sensors from being put into the vehicles. So this is another incentive for cutting the number of sensors in the uh, electric vehicles or battery systems. So the solution I try to propose here is uh, reduced voltage sensing. That is, I try to measure the total voltage of multiple cells connecting in series instead of the single cell voltages. And then because we still need to prevent overcharge and over discharge for every single cell, I need to estimate the single cell voltages from the total voltage. And uh, so that's the first formula to this problem in a mathematical way. And uh, so suppose that we have two cells in here and uh, they're connected in series. Uh, so the currents flowing in and out of the cell, are, these two cells are the same. So ideally, they should have the same amount of energy. So that's the SOC and the voltage should be the same. Uh, if this is always the case, then my life is going to be really easy. I can take the total voltage divided by two. I can get a single cell voltages. However, uh, SOC imbalance is a very common phenomenon among battery cells in, in, in the pack. So it's very often the case that we'll have for one cell have higher SOC than the other cell. So in this way, we can only measure the, the input current and also the total voltage V1 plus V2. And then we need to design observer to estimate the single cell SOCs and voltages from the total voltage. So mathematically, we have two cells with different states, X1 and X2. And X here stands for state of charge. Uh, I will try to analyze this problem by using a battery electrical model, current circuit model. So basically, for each cell, uh, the SOC of the cell X uh, is calculated by summing the current over time divided by capacity Q. And the output voltage is a nonlinear function of SOC, G of X, the open circuit voltage, and also a uh, voltage drop across the internal resistance. Uh, there also might also be some dynamic terms in here, like RC pairs, which I didn't show in here. And we have one of these equations for each cell. 
And uh, so the states of the system is X1 and X2, the two uh, SOCs. Uh, K here stands for discrete time step. And so the, the, the output of the system is the total stream voltage V stream, uh, V1 plus V2. So the goal here is to estimate X1 and X2 based on V1 plus V2. You're assuming the resistance is the same, though. That's yeah, awesome. yeah. So that's what I do at this point. So later I will, I will, I will talk about like how we expand uh, this discussion to estimate capacity difference and also the resistance difference because capacity distance is also very common among cells and it will contribute to SOC imbalance. Mm -hmm. So let's make it more complicated. So I have to do some kind of investigation to that later. And uh, so first let's look at like the, the physical intuitions like is such attempts ever feasible? Uh, so this is the voltage versus SOC relationship G of X of a certain Berry chemistry. So the X axis here stands for the SOC, and the Y axis here stands for the voltage. And uh, so let's zoom into this region here. So suppose now that we have three combinations of two cell groups, as marked by the blue, the red, and the black dots in here. So the blue, the blue groups, uh, the two cells have the same SOC. So therefore, it's on top of each, each other around this line. We, so we only see one blue, blue uh, dot. And the two red ones, there's a slight SOC imbalance between the two. So they are kind of some distance apart along this curve. And for the black ones, there's an even bigger SOC imbalance. So they are further apart. So if we look at the total voltage of them at a single time instant, for example, at the current time step, all these three combinations give the same total voltage of 6.87 volt, as given by the, this uh, square marker. Uh, in this total stream voltage plot, which means that it is not possible to distinguish them by looking at the total voltage at a single time step. However, what if we look, try to look at the trajectory of the total voltage over time? So now suppose that we supply current to all the cells in here. So therefore, their SOC will move along this curve. And uh, so because of the nonlinearity of this curve, we can actually see a difference among the trajectory of their voltage evolution over time. So which lays the foundation for our estimation efforts. So now I will try to examine the mathematical underpinning behind the physical intuition, which is the observability analysis. So the, the, this equation here describes the relationship between the total voltage trajectory uh, in, in, increments and also the increments of the single cell SOCs over time under current load. So here is the, um, so one uh, row here uh, stands for one time step. And so this matrix in between consists of the first order gradients of the G of X function at the respective SOCs. And so in order for the single cell SOCs, as in here, to be observable from the total voltage trajectory, <laughs> this, this relationship needs to be a one-to-one -one mapping, which means that uh, this matrix in between needs to be of four rank. And this, in this case, it needs to be of rank two because we have two cells in here. So this matrix is by definition the observability matrix of the systems. And so now we see like why, clearly that's why we need multiple measurements of total voltage. Because if we only have one measurement, then we will only have one row in here. So the rank of this matrix will be one, short of the two which is required for observability. And furthermore, this matrix can be transformed to, to this form in here, which consists of the first order and second order gradients of the G of X function at the, time, uh, at the same time instant. So now we see that why we need the, the G of X function to be nonlinear. Because if it's linear, then second order gradient will be all zero. So the second row here will be all zero, which means that even if we have multiple rows in here, the rank will still be one. So that's why we need this relationship to, to be nonlinear. So it will become un, uh, unobservable when x1, k, and x2, k are the same? I'm sorry? When x1, k, and x2, k are the same, the determinant will be zero. No? Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, they are the same as one cell. Right. Same as same cell. So but we have some robust issue in here. So in the real time, I, I, I try to use some kind of a method such as SVD, the, the singular value decomposition, to kind of overcome this issue, so which can improve the robustness of the, the algorithm in real time. So, uh, so based on this analysis, I then I try to design uh, different algorithms to solve this, um, uh, this estimation problems. So, so basically, we need to use the trajectory, not the single point measurement, and also we need to utilize the uh, nonlinearity of the G of X function. And so one of the methods I use is the moving horizon observer. And uh, so, uh, sorry, so, uh, so more details can be found in these two of my papers. And uh, so then 
finally, I try to apply the design observer to actual berries. And for example, here we have the, uh, the, the, the GFX function for iron phosphate berry, A123 systems. And uh, so this is uh, its GFX function. And uh, so these two plots shows the first order and second order gradients of the GFX function. And we can see that the, the, the open circuit voltage is pretty nonlinear at the very high and very low SOC regions. So therefore, according to the previous analysis, the single cell LSOCs are observable in these two regions. And this is kind of good news for us because these regions are the most critical for preventing overcharge and overdischarge. So this plot in here, uh, two plots in here shows the, uh, the experimental validation. So this plot shows the validation of the SOC estimation, and this one shows the voltage estimation. Uh, the two solid line here uh, stands for the, uh, the actual SOC of the two cells. So there's a gap between the two, which stands for 5% imbalance in the SOC of the two cells. And the two dashed line stands for the estimation. And uh, we can see that uh, the estimation for the two cells starts at the same point uh, because we assume that the, the two cells are perfectly balanced. And then as the SOC gradually evolves to the above 85% and step into the nonlinear and hence observable regions, the two estimates gradually converge to the actual values. And it's pretty much the same thing for the voltage estimation. So at this point, I've finished talking about the system level battery management. And uh, let me give a summary. Uh, I've explored two topics for the uh, system level battery management. The first one is battery pack temperature estimation. And uh, so first, I construct a thermal model which captures the surface and core temperature of all cells in the pack. And then I try to design an online parameter identification algorithm to determine the model parameters uh, automatically by using the onboard signals. And then I try to combine the model with the sparse temperature sensing to, to create a robust observer which can guarantee minimize worst case estimation error under the uncertainty brought by the sparse temperature sensing. And uh, so the second topic I've explored is SOC and voltage estimation under reduced voltage sensing. And first, I conducted observability analysis to establish the conditions for the, in order for the single cell SOC to be observable from total voltage, uh, which is first, uh, we will need to look at the trajectory. And the second, uh, we need to uh, have the nonlinearity in the voltage versus SOC relationship. And uh, then I tried to design a nonlinear observer to perform the um, estimation under reduced voltage sensing. And also, finally, I have also extend the analysis to, and to estimating cell capacities and resistance under reduced voltage sensing. So if, if I have time, I can address this. I have some backup slides to describe this um, in the Q&A session. So then apart from control-related work, there's a second, uh, another dimension with my research concerning uh, lithium batteries, which is the physics-based investigation and modeling. And the one thing I've done is neutral imaging of lithium batteries. And I know that Professor uh, Pascalari of the mechanical engineering has also done extensive work on neutral imaging and mostly on fuel cells. And uh, so it will be great if I can collaborate with you, with you in future on this topic on lithium batteries. So Steve Sue, but he has got some chemistry department. He oh. does quite a bit of uh, electron microscope things, you know, with the lithium ions. Oh, he I did see. Did some analysis for us. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, I can also. He's a pretty famous guy. Okay, Steve Chu. Steve Su. Steve Su. UIB, yeah. It's UIB, okay. Cool. And uh, so the purpose of this project is to measure the lithium distribution inside the battery cell during operation. Uh, the contribution is that um, for a long time, the only thing we can measure on a battery is its voltage, which actually can now tell us a lot about what's really going on inside the cell. And for, so this is one of the first research uh, successful attempt to uh, measure the internal states of the battery, especially during operation. And uh, so let me talk about the principle of this technology a little bit. So if we point a neutron, uh, a beam of neutron towards a subject, uh, object, and this, in this case, it will be the battery. So different elements of the materials of the battery will have different ability of, uh, new, uh, of attenuating or blocking the, the neutrons uh, in the beam. So for example, as shown in this schematic in here, so the, neutron, uh, the lithium, uh, this uh, light blue uh, circle in here, uh, has a stronger, has a large cross section, and hence stronger ability of blocking the neutrons than most of the other materials uh, in the battery. So therefore, if we put a detector behind the lithium batteries, we will see like dark and uh, light spots on the detector. The dark spots will correspond to the location with uh, with high lithium concentration because the lithium uh, the lithium blocks the neutrons, and the, the 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 light spots will correspond to those locations with low lithium concentration. 
So by correlating this image, uh, we can we can correlate this uh, lithium back to the uh, lithium distribution uh, across the battery pack across the the, the battery electrode. And uh, so uh, we have done this in collaboration with the National National Institute of Standard Technology NIST uh, uh, Neutron Research Center. And so we fly to their uh, Maryland campus and to use their neutron facilities. And uh, we, we do this experiment by using our own cells. Uh, more details can be found in this three of our previous publications. And uh, so in order to do this experiment, uh, we need to design and fabricate our own battery cells for many reasons. And uh, so the first one is that uh, we need to customize the shape and dimension of the cells. And it is true that we can buy all different kind of cells from the market. Uh, we can buy coin cells syringical cell, and also prismatic cells. Uh, but the previous two, uh, they, they, they do not fit for this experiment because we would want the, the dimension of the cell to be uniform uh, along the beam path. So the only option is the prismatic cell. Uh, however, the, the commercial prismatic cell we, we, bought from, we can buy from the market uh, can, can, cannot be used for experiment either because for two reasons. The first one is that we would prefer to know and control the composition of the battery. For example, we want to know like what is the maximum amount of cyclo lithium uh, across the battery electrode. And, but typically, the manufacturers, they just don't give away this information. And secondly, we also need to, some use, uh, need to use some special materials inside the battery. Uh, so for example, we do not want too much like hydrogen elements uh, in the battery. Uh, this is because, let's go back to the schematic in here. Uh, I did mention previously that actually hydrogen has the, the, the largest uh, cross-section, and hence, and hence have the strongest ability of blocking the neutrons. So this is why like, this is used uh, uh, like so much for neutron imaging of fuel cell. And so, th so therefore, if we have too much hydrogen in the lithium batteries, it may basically break, break, uh, block out everything. So we probably do not see anything on the detector. So the solution for this is to use the deuterated isotope of hydrogen, which is D, uh, a proton plus a neutron which has a very small cross-section and can avoid this problem. So therefore, we, that's the reason why we need to make all these cells. And uh, so we have someone working in a chemical engineering lab to build the cells for us for like three months. And he has built like 200 coin cells uh, to figure out the recipes and the procedure of doing it. And also finally made like 10 cells used for experiments. I knew this very well because that poor guy was me. And, uh, so I started with zero chemical engineering background, but through the process, I, I learned a lot. So now I can claim that I have some backgrounds in uh, chemical and electrochemical engineering process. And uh, these are the procedures I figured to build the cells. So I start from like scratch, from like powders I can buy from the uh, commercial like uh, vendors. So these are like the powders for the active materials for the both the positive and the negative electrode. For example, the LMO powder and also the graphite powder. And then I try to mix and grind them dissolve them with um, solvent to make a paste, and then I paste them on the mold, which is designed to, to fit the dimension and the shape of the electrode we want. And, uh, and then I bake and dry it up, so basically like cooking. And then finally, I assemble everything inside the glove box. So for example, this is the example of the cells we built. So this uh, red plate here are made of copper, which is used as the current collector for the, for the uh, negative electrode. And uh, this uh, silver plates here are made of aluminum, which is used for the current character for the positive electrode. So we have pockets here in the uh, copper plate. We put all the electrodes we have in there, and also the separator in between. We add the electrolyte, and then we close uh, this two and, and, and fix and seal it with screws and bolts. So in this way, we, ha we have a battery for neutral imaging test. So this is one of the uh, neutral images we've taken from the experiment. So the, 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 the dark spot stands for high leasing concentration, and the black spot uh, stands for low leasing uh, concentration. And so this afternoon, in my talk this afternoon, I'm going to talk about how I plan to use this data to, improve, to model the electrochemical dynamics of lithium batteries. And uh, so finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about my work experiences at Ford Motor Company. And so now, as a research engineer, on one hand, I'm working on applying the system-level battery manual strategies to electro vehicles that I have developed. On the other hand, I'm also involved in multiple EV systems and components development projects. So for example, one of the projects I've been involved in is the electro vehicle DC fast charging system development. And we know that one of the major drawbacks with electro vehicles these days is the slow charging speed. Uh, usually it will take like three to four hours to fully charge the EV by using the in-home AC charger. It's kind of very slow. 
So by using this DC fast charging system, we can charge like 80% of a focus path within 20 minutes. So it's still slower than the speed you, you fill, fill up your tank, but it's kind of a big step forward. And uh, so this is a very fun project. I, I, I have learned a lot through the process, and also I'm going to see the, the vehicle on the market pretty soon. And it also gives a new idea about my future research. I'm going to talk about this afternoon. But that's the only thing, that's one thing I, I don't really like about it. So that's when, when we were kind of testing the fast charging systems. Every time we finish the charging, and then we have to deplete, discharge the battery pack before we can test it again. And, and the fastest way and the best way of doing it is to drive it on the road. So I ended up like spending like four or five hours a day driving this vehicle on the road. And that is when I figured that I would never want to be an Uber driver. <laughs> and uh, to make it worse, there is a very good feature about electric vehicles, which is called regenerative braking. That is, every time you step on the brake, it can recycle the energy. And this is one of the major reasons why EVs can save energy. It turned out to be one, to one of my biggest nightmares. Because every time I stop at the top traffic light, I apply the, the brake. It was set in the screen like, congratulations, you successfully recycle like 99% of energy. Which means that I, have spent, I need to spend another like five minutes on the road. So, just kind of a... But yeah, all joking aside, this is a great kind of project, and I think it will have a big impact in the popularization of electric vehicles what, in the what future. What is the typical profile of your current? That's a very good question. So at this point, for fast charging, we do CCCV, constant current and constant voltage. Apparently, that is not the best way of doing it. And I know that you, you are actually engaging in this research recently, like kind of uh, considering like thermal constraint and also degradation constraint, so to kind of come up with the best profile. So there are kind of uh, many trade-offs in here. So one way, if we want to charge it as soon as possible, we want to use very high current. But if we're using very high current, and uh, it, will, yeah, it will drive up the temperature, and the battery will degrade faster under high temperature. And also, like, high current weight itself will also accelerate battery degradation. So there are a lot of like, um, kind of uh, trade-offs in there we need to consider during the, the process of uh, this design. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about this this afternoon. And uh, so apart from this, I'm also involved in multiple like, university collaboration projects. So for example, uh, we have one with uh, University of Michigan and uh, General Electric. Uh, probably I shouldn't talk in this here. And uh, I'm just kidding. Okay. And, uh, because I know like GE is a competitor with UTC. So, and, uh, so this is an externally funded project by RPE and uh, by DOE RPE agency. And uh, so in this project, we, we studied how to improve battery control by using some normal sensor developed by GE to measure the, which measures the internal strength of the battery during operation. Because we know that when we charge and discharge the battery, uh, the electrode will expand and shrink. So it will, increase, increase, will, will create stress inside the battery. And this stress and the strain is one of the major reasons for battery degradation. So this project is about like, how we can use this information to improve battery degradation, uh, mitigating battery degradation. And uh, so there's another project with Ohio State University. And it's funded by Ford. And I serve as the cooperate PI. And uh, so this, this project studies how to investigate whether the battery aging will propagate among cells Where in the battery pack. I'm sorry? Is it Rizzoni? Yeah, Giorgio Rizzoni, yeah. Yeah, we also work with like Marcello, Canova, yeah, so on this project, so, yeah, so. Being at the University of Michigan, the alumnus, do you like working with Ohio State? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Giorgio Rizzoni him, himself, Rizzoni yeah, is, uh, Rizzoni is the Michigan guy. Michigan. He, he got all his degrees from Michigan, and uh, so, yeah, he's yeah. Nice guy, actually. I'm sorry? He's a nice man. Yeah, he's, he's a really nice I never met him, but I, I see. Him. Yeah, he's also done a lot of work on battery control yeah, like you. So, And uh, so, yeah, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Any questions? Thank you. I want to curious question. Sure. You said you built the battery on your own, right? Did it work or? <laughs> That's a very good question. I didn't mention that. The only part that was not so great about it is that my cells didn't work very well. So the thing is like, it is, the, the difficult part is not to get it to work. I can get it to work like I can, I can have voltage, I can have capacity, I can have not very big resistance. The difficult part is to get the theoretical capacity and the resistance. That's what we calculate from the paper by, by kind of uh, correlating to like what kind of, how many materials we're putting there. And uh, basically for three, reasons, for three reasons. The first reason is that um, I do everything by hand. I don't have those fancy machines for mixing, for grinding, or for whatever those procedures. 
And the, the second reason is that um, uh, we have some special requirements on the berries. So our berry is different from the commercial counterparts. For example, like in order to do the neutron imaging experiment, because we have limits on the resolution, and so we will prefer the thickness of the electrode to be, to be thicker, uh, a lot thicker than the uh, commercial applications. For example, we will want it to be like 150 microns, and the typical case is only 50 microns. So the thicker we, we made it, it's really hard to make it homogeneous. That's also another reason for that. So I can actually get a capacity like for coin cell with the same capacity with the commercial uh, counterparts, but I put in more materials in there, so it's not a theoretical capacity. And the third reason is that uh, there are a lot of trade secrets that nobody wants to give up in this industry. So I have to figure really hard like through all the research I can find to, to figure out all the procedures I found in there. But there are also very, there are kind of frequently many kind of critical steps they, steps they just missed out. For example, like uh, later I figured out like after I make the electrode and dry it up, I need to compress the electrode a little bit to, to, to make it compact so that it will work better. And uh, so, and then it still didn't work out very well. So then after a couple months of searching, I find in a very kind of uh, negligible corner of a very long paper, it says like you have to compress the wind's hot. So these are all kind of details in there that's kind of uh, make me like why my cell didn't work very well as the commercial ones. But uh, yeah, but I learned a lot through this process. So, so I think the, the so later it's like, because like we just spent too much time on it and then so we have decided, like, maybe we, we need to seek, seek collaboration with, uh, with uh, manufacturers of the berries. So we went to A123s. So we asked, asked them to give, give us their electrode with all the information we need. And then we, we kind of get the electrode back and we assemble it by ourselves. And we share the results we have with them. So I think it's a way of benefiting both the industry and the, and the academia. So, uh, questions? So you mentioned at the last of, uh, end of your talk the swelling of the electrodes with the charge discharge cycle, right? The, the volume change. How does that affect your neutron Im imaging analysis? Because when you do shoot the neutron and then you reference it back and forth between charged states, the cell is not yeah. where it is. Yeah, that's a very good question. So that's why we have a second paper about how to use neutron imaging to observe the expansion of the electrode by using neutron imaging data. But that's a very a uh, good question is like, oh, I didn't do that work myself. Uh, we have a couple of people working on that. I'm responsible for my part. Like the, and I think what he did is like, he tried to fit to align the, the peak. We, we have the line profile consists of peaks. He, he tried to like the, the combine, comparing two like images. So there will be a shift because of the expansion. So he tried to uh, fit for, to, to align those peaks back together. And then in this way, he tried to kind of figure out the expansion and try to correct for that. Yeah, this is what I kind of remember how we try to. We, we have the same issue in fuel cell imaging when the membranes swell and shrink with hydration. The, the reference image that you use to subtract to calculate the intensity shifts. We, we have a paper on how to correct for that, and I think we thought that, and that that would be very useful for the lithium ion electrons. Yeah, sure. Because. And then was working on, I think, he was working with your group to do the analysis, and we actually liked that. This was a few years ago, I think maybe 2003. Who is him? Dan, Dan Hussey. At oh, Dan Hussey. Yeah, we were also working with them. We were working with Dan and yeah. David. Yeah, David. And David, yeah. I actually, I met one of your students a couple of years ago when I was there doing the experiment. So, yeah, so, yeah that's, that's how I knew that you were also kind of working on it. That was back in 2010. Yeah, we've been yeah. doing that for, for about 10 years. Yeah, yeah. So it will be great if I can learn from you from, about this technology in the future. So. Thank you very much. On the temperature sensor, um, if uh, I'm the customer and you know, so I give you bounds on what's the maximum error that I want, how would you go about um, you know, determining the, the minimum number of sensors and their placement? Sort of the reverse of what you were saying. Uh, that's a very good question. And it's also actually something that um, I think it will be a very interesting topic for me to do in future, like sensor deployment and sensor design. So at this point, I have done some initial work on this. Uh, so the, very, the, the, I do, the things I do is actually a very clumsy way. So I have two, two 10 cells there, right? So I, I can try to put sensors on each of these 10 cells. So what I do at this point is like, I just try, I just move the sensors one at each time. I do all the, pro, repeat all the procedures, and I try to look at the estimation arrows. And also all like the cost of the H-infinity uh, arrows. And then I try to pick the, the best uh, 
location to do it. But this is a very clumsy way to do it. I think there's a more systematic way of doing it in future. Uh, that will be part of my, my, my future work, uh, research plan, I think. Any uh, ideas on how you would go about doing it? Um, I would think it would be related to like observability or identifiability analysis. That's, that was like uh, the perspective I can give on the control side. But you have better suggestions? I see, yeah. It's, it seems like it's an interesting and uh, significant problem to investigate. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you very much.